So in the twilight of my 20s, I decided to dive headfirst into official adulthood and see Old, directed by M. Night Shyamalan and starring Gail Garcia Bernal, Vicky Creeps, Alex Wolf, and the looming specter of mortality. And it was one hour and 48 minutes of my young and vibrant life that I won't be getting back. We open on a happy nuclear family, mother, father, son, and daughter, driving to the tropical Enmico Resort, where a congenial staff welcomes them with complimentary drinks and concierge service. The sun is shining, the food is plentiful, and the hotel room looks great. The following morning at breakfast, however, the deal sweetens even further. The proprietor tips them off to a private beach located on a nearby nature preserve, one that he recommends only to certain guests. One chauffeur drive later, and the quartet stroll through a rocky pass to emerge upon a beautiful, isolated coastline. They set up their umbrellas and blankets, and are even joined in short order by another couple of families. But it's not long before there's trouble in paradise. A suspicious bloodied man is lurking nearby, a dead body is floating in an adjacent cove, and the kids are weirdly hungry for having only been there about half an hour. It doesn't take long before our protagonists realize the horrifying, impossible, but undeniable truth. The beach! Something about this beach is making all of them rapidly age. And try as they might, there's seemingly no escape. After over two decades producing, directing, and writing crazy, creepy horror thrillers for both big and small screens, M. Night Shyamalan is a filmmaker who needs no introduction, if only because a lot of people would prefer that he not be introduced, period. I want to be clear up top, though, that I have nothing but goodwill towards Knight as a creator. The dude's hit-to-miss ratio skews ever southward, but I respect his willingness to stand by his craft while still being a proud family man. In old, the tropes of his filmography are all present. In addition to the usual genre beats, marriage riven by infidelity as a subplot, and you just gotta know that some of these people are from Philadelphia. But while I'm in a charitable mood, let's talk about a couple of things that make old bold. First, plenty of praise is due for its setting. Countless horror films take place in dark, enclosed spaces. Caves, forests, haunted mansions, etc. So to have one be set in the bright, wide-open tropics, yet still feel credibly confining, is a compelling feat. Even among those films which do delve into seaside scares, its conceit is novel. The threat isn't sharks, or parasites, or Jeff Goldblum, <laughs> but rapid aging, usually only a risk if you left the SPF 30 in the car. We do get some scenes in the dark, but most make full use of the on-location meets CGI beach, and its expansive shoreline and uncanny sheer cliffs look absolutely dazzling by daylight. Second, and this is a double-edged sword, the story is committed to explaining in its own nebulous, warped logic how the beach works. It's really weird, though, that every assumption the characters make about what's going on and how is implied to be correct. From the fact that the rocks surrounding them are what are causing the aging, to why people black out when they try to leave the beach, to the rough approximation that half an hour on the beach is the equivalent of one year. If they're wrong, it never matters enough to be of any consequence. Lastly, this premise is fertile ground for existential horror and a meditation on the human condition. What if you lived out the rest of your lifetime in a single day is the pitch, essentially, and one which the film gamely mines for both reflective confessionals and escalations of the circle of life, which recall Darren Aronofsky's mother and their delirious efficiency. Far too often, though, the topic is broached with heavy-handed references to aging and time, like, I just need more time, or one spouse accusing the other of only thinking about the future. I wonder if everyone still feels like a kid when they're our age. Got to me a little. But by the very nature of its premise, there's not enough time to tease out such dilemmas before moving on to the next plot point. In that spirit, most dialogue is more on the nose than a pair of sunglasses. Knight's always been a fan of scattering a whole breadcrumb trail of setup for a big gingerbread house payoff, and at his best, there's some semblance of naturalism to what people say or do that'll rear its head in the third act. I didn't expect a pile of discarded silverware to come back into play, for example, but someone definitely got served. The occasional sight of a flickering camera on a faraway hillside was also suitably mysterious, although it did give me flashbacks to another island-bound thriller. Nevertheless, countless opportunities for tension are deflated by a character outright stating what is happening, what emotion they're feeling, or what bullet on their resume will be relevant to the matter at hand. The main kid literally introduces himself to others by saying, what are your names and occupations? Later, one grown man greets another by saying, my name is Jared, I'm a doctor. My thoughts have more color in them now, says one of the kids as they do a speed run of puberty. It's like my mind is changing too, says another. I appreciate the recognition that mental changes accompany the physical ones. Knight could have done a soft remake of Jack, but he didn't, and I respect that. Yet surely there's better ways to phrase it than that? There's exposition, and then there's just scripting your major motion picture like a radio play. It all feels like placeholders, like notes that Knight scribbled in brackets and a rough draft and just never got around to editing it as something more nuanced. This kind of wonkiness works in, say, The Visit, where the characters are all either tweens or demented senior citizens, but except for one member of the beachgoers who's battling mental illness, everybody here is too ostensibly sound of mind to sell such oddball lines. Pro tip, by the way, if you repeatedly have characters say, I'm scared, 
It's the horror version of a laugh track. I kind of wonder if I'd share that sentiment if you just stayed quiet. Indeed, no question is too stupid, no observation too obvious for one of our players to not declare it like a video game sidekick when you get stuck on a puzzle. What happened to her? Someone asks when a body washes up on the shore. I don't know, maybe she drowned? Also, it apparently takes the mom's extensive archaeological know-how to confirm that, yeah, it is unusual for a body to skeletonize in like an hour. The same openly panicked mom will lose track of her kids for long stretches of time, and at the climax, overcorrects by going out of her way to find them and tell them to hide when they were already sequestered in the dark far away from any danger. These issues dovetail all too readily with Knight's penchant for writing his characters of one-note personal or professional tics. The dad is an actuary, so we get bits where he warns people about the statistical frequency of various kinds of accidents. The wife curates museums, so she frets about how this whole crisis relates to her anxiety about a life spent studying the dead and decayed. The doctor doctors, and the psychologist psychologizes. As for the child actors, after Haley Joel Osment's breakout in The Sixth Sense, I can't knock Knight for leaning on precocious performances, but nobody is as grating as the little boy in the first act. Fortunately, this is the rare movie where you know an irritating kid won't stay that way for long, but until then, I was getting a few premature wrinkles myself from cringing at lines like, we can go to the same college together and become neighbors with mortgages. Knight's flicks have always been peppered with goofy asides and awkward conversations, but it's hard not to feel like he's cranked up the laughs lately after seeing Jordan Peele's mainstream success with horror comedies. Here, though, the theoretical jokes manifest not as a function of comic timing or clever writing, but rather blunt force non sequiturs, like the girl exclaiming how she recognizes a rapper in their company who's named Midsize Sedan. If Knight is just throwing this stuff in to amuse his kids during the premiere, then good for him, but personally I was hoping that he'd keep the Nickelodeon humor in his actual Nickelodeon movies. I did get a chuckle out of the two African American characters correctly predicting that they'll wear their age better than everyone else though. I didn't expect Black Don't Crack to be a world building tool in a body horror movie, but 2021 has been full of surprises. Even more uncomfortable than the dialogue though is how it's delivered. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with giving lower-profile, non-American actors a role in Hollywood summer blockbusters. Lord knows Knight lost his A-lister privileges sometime after the happening anyway. But the mom and dad in this movie are played by a Luxembourgish and a Mexican actor, respectively, giving them very distinctive accents that neither of their children share. Combined with flat performances across the board, it becomes a Gal Gadot-esque struggle to interpret exactly what emotion someone's trying to convey in any given scene. It's not off-kilter enough to be Lynchian, but neither is it over-the-top enough to be campy. Knight's worked with Joaquin Phoenix twice. He knows how to get a good performance, so I want to believe he's doing this on purpose, but why? Hmm, that's new. Rufus Sewell seems to be the only one who, as the saying goes, understands the assignment, as a cardiothoracic surgeon who slowly succumbs to violent schizophrenia as the day progresses. There's some big Stephen King energy to his descent from helpful paternal figure to dangerous lunatic, and it's no coincidence that where he goes, most of the movie's best scares follow. Yet Old's most bizarre, omnipresent flaw is its camera work. Knight's films are often about things unseen. Dead people, superhuman potential, signs from God, what lurks beyond the boundaries of our world. Somehow, though, the director has gotten confused about how literal that lack of sight should be because this could be the first horror movie told from a second-person perspective. When the camera withholds showing the kids' faces after their first growth spurt, it's an acceptable tease. But as the reel proceeds, so too do a bevy of not just reaction shots, but full-on reaction scenes. A dog dies, off-screen. A woman goes through a whole final trimester of pregnancy and then gives birth to a baby that also dies from lack of attention, off screen. A corpse decays into a skeleton, off screen. And I'm, I'm sorry, I just I can't get over that last one. Framing a shot through a rib cage is cool, but it couldn't have been a budgetary limitation. Fake skeletons have been a horror props hallmark since the silent era. You used to see things in an M. Night Shyamalan movie. Stupid things, sometimes, but you saw them. A ghost vomiting, an alien crashing a birthday party, a guy playing lawnmower limbo. You got hints, you got glimpses, but then you saw it. Forget old though, this should have been called told. The irony of the film marketing itself with a rebrand of that quintessential Snapchat filter is the effects never come close to approximating actual oldness as any average person would picture it. Bad old guy makeup is always awful, but when this is the title and the premise of your movie, you gotta put the age in A-game. This should have made Benjamin Button look like J. Edgar. Yet the most that any of the adults visibly wither away is with a couple of crow's feet and some neck flab, and then the parents pass of expedited natural causes looking not much more than a decade grayer than when we first met them. I kept squinting to see if they at least low-key receded some hairlines, but unless the film was shot in sequence, I doubt anybody bothered. Most of the noticeable growth is reserved for the kids, for whom the aged up recasting is pretty good, although even this isn't consistent. The sister doesn't seem to keep pace with the brother, and Alex Wolf looks a lot older than 16 as far as I'm concerned. 
Rapid growth or aging is a trope ripe for indelible imagery, so it's just a damn shame that Knight consistently elects to have it described instead of depicted. I'm not asking for a prolonged time lapse or grindhouse gore of, like, the kid's baby teeth all falling out simultaneously. But if you're gonna tell me that people have to remove a swelling tumor on the spot, I gotta see that from somewhere clearer than, like, a boulder in the middle distance. You already got Alex Wolf here, my man. Learn from Ari Aster. A little violence can go a long, long way. A few sequences near the climax finally do flex the gruesome potential of the premise. An antagonist is bested by rust poisoning that rushes through his veins like black vines, and a bikini girl with a calcium deficiency turns into a hunchbacked crone, her bones cracking and rapidly mending until she's a grotesque human pretzel. Knight is apparently on record as saying he has a phobia of elderly people, but between this and Unbreakable, I suspect he's equally terrified of people who don't drink enough milk. Even these revelations, though, can't pass without commentary from another party present. At any given moment, Old is either so fixated on mystery that it foregoes depicting rational reactions, or conversely, it's so afraid of audience confusion that it spells out what's happening in letters that even the most elderly of moviegoers won't need glasses to read. So, straight thoughts. The twist of the movie is that the beach is apparently just a naturally occurring thing, but a pharmaceutical company is luring people there to test the lifelong efficiency of new drugs for various diseases, of which numerous members of the families present were suffering. Putting aside the half-hearted moral ambiguity here, the fatal problem with this twist is that it has nothing to do with the themes set up until that point. The Sixth Sense is about a kid who learns to help the dead people that he sees find peace, and the twist is that Bruce Willis is one such lost soul. Unbreakable is about a guy who learns he's a superhero, and the twist is that his mentor is a supervillain. Even The Visit, very much an After the Fall Shyamalan joint, is about two siblings reconciling with their estranged grandparents, and the twist is that those two aren't actually their grandparents at all. It's called a twist because you take an idea or a person that you think you understand and you bend it out of shape. Otherwise, it's just a thing that happens. For a movie so invested in questions of life, death, love, and family, Big Pharma, am I right? It's just not a satisfying capper. The adaptation from existing source material is probably a factor. Depending on who you ask, it's not the first time Shyamalan has based a film on a book, but I believe it's the first time he's decided to graft a twist onto a tale that previously ended without one. As long as we're talking medicine then, I gotta say, this procedure didn't take. It's explained that people's hair and nails don't grow excessively while aging because they're made of dead cells, which, fair enough, but I would've gotten a kick out of seeing at least a few Merlin beards. Someone acknowledges that there's no animals on the beach, but like, is something in particular keeping them out, or did they just have their own sixth sense to stay away from the place? The jig would definitely be up sooner if dead fish kept washing up on shore. Shyamalan boasts perhaps his most transparent cameo to date as the driver who takes the characters to the setting of the film and is later revealed to be the one actually filming them from afar. Say what you want about his self-insert from Lady in the Water, but at least there he wasn't literally casting and shooting a movie. Also, my friend, if your whole business depends on nobody ever making it out of here alive, you gotta wait more than 90 seconds before determining that the attempted escapees have drowned. Also, what if someone brings binoculars to the beach? The resort packs a disproportionate amount of food for the family because the kids will go through it all in a matter of hours to sustain their rapid growth. This gets us the delightfully icky sight and sound of someone eating pasta salad out of a sack by hand, but since the resort plans on the kids dying there and they don't even have anything wrong with them that needs testing, why not just let them starve to death? Were they trying to make sure the test doesn't get cut short by cannibalism? Maybe it's just the eternal symbolic potential of this element as a source of life. But it's interesting to see accelerated aging so often associated in fiction with water or watery locations, from Time Fall and Death Stranding to that X-Files episode where Mulder and Scully get old but, uh, get better. That the expedited cell growth which the beach engenders grants a minor healing factor is an interesting way to turn a gift into a curse, especially when an attempt to perform surgery is complicated by the incision forcefully resealing itself. That being said, uh, how on earth do you use the guy with a clotting disorder to introduce this ability? He's the one person it shouldn't even work on. Line from Rufus Sewell, which I now live by. Let's just concentrate on the issue at hand. Movies. There's a part where the dad is getting assaulted and the mom doesn't hear it because she's going deaf in one ear and facing the other direction, but... Come on, that's not how hearing works. It's not the sonic equivalent of dealing with a boo in Super Mario World. Was it ever confirmed that people who swim out to sea without using the coral tunnel, another neat visual by the way, also black out, or does it just so happen that the past 72 groups of people were all terrible swimmers? One character proposes using a bundle of pool noodles to swim away from the beach, demonstrating that while they can't get any internet out there, they do have access to a series of tubes. And there's some lamp shading throughout about how the resort hides people dying there. They have everyone's passports and they can do some remote hackery to scrub folks' recent online activity. But you can't tell me about like a hundred people going missing after booking a trip to the same location wouldn't raise some eyebrows by now. At minimum, this place is getting an HBO true crime event series. Oh, 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 sorry. Right. 
Overall, I give this film a 4 out of 10. It's got a great concept and some memorably creepy visuals, but on the whole, it's laughably written and performed from birth to death. Horror comedy can work, but here the horror is hampered by inexplicably stingy shot composition and the comedy is mostly awkward and distracting. It's not Knight's worst movie, but I wouldn't hesitate to call it his most forgettable. High concept, low execution, and without even many big names to chew the scenery. Age before beauty is all well and good, but if you want to skip to the ladder for your next movie night, feel free to just put this one in the retirement home. <sighs> now if you excuse me, it's about 4.30 where I am, so I think it's time for me to kick back in my recliner with a nice bowl of soup and some reruns of Law and Order. <laughs>